good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you about the uh, type of uh, material service and the material research that we provide here at the Moldex 3D uh, headquarters. So when we are talking about uh, quality uh, simulations, often uh, we think about the mesh, the uh, process condition, uh, the uh, CAD file, and everything. But uh, really, the last missing puzzle to a quality simulation is material properties. It, uh, very often, we uh, hear about people you, uh, saying that uh, we want to use the generic uh, material properties. But uh, there is nothing generic about generic properties at all, because after all, every material is unique. And that's why we have to have a thorough material uh, uh, characterization for the, uh, for the materials that's to be used. And when we speak about uh, material characterizations, uh, here are uh, why we need to do it. When we are trying to do CA simulations, uh, what we are try trying to do essentially is to solve uh, the, uh, uh, these uh, governing equations. So what you can see here on the, uh, on the board is um, uh, ranging from mass balance, momentum balance, uh, and uh, to energy balance. So what these equations have in common uh, is that uh, you, know, you need to have the material properties in order to solve these uh, governing equations. And, uh, what, uh, and uh, you, need to you need to have a density, viscosity, heat capacity, and the thermal conductivity, and so on and so forth, in order to, in order to solve these uh, equations. So these are the uh, fundamental material properties that we need in order to address these uh, issues. And when we are talking about thermal set the materials, uh, we also need to know is a conversion. So these are the information that you cannot know simply, uh, simply just by standing in front of your injection and molding machines. So these are the material properties that we, we would uh, need for the quality CA simulations. And when you want to do uh, uh, further uh, simulations such as your warpage predictions, then what you will need is uh, uh, what's so-called the PVT effect. And also, you, if you want to predict the modules, uh, what you, you would need is the uh, uh, mechanical properties and so on and so forth. So in the layman's term, uh, uh, here what, uh, what we say is accurate material information provide a better simulation results. But really, uh, what we usually uh, uh, joke around is a garbage in equals to garbage out. So this is essentially what, uh, you, know, what you would get with uh, using the proper material information. So these are current, uh, the current uh, equipment lineups uh, uh, we have in our headquarters. So we have uh, uh, everything from uh, capillary rheometers to uh, uh, PBT and uh, to uh, uh, even the rotational rheometers and uh, also uh, DSC and uh, everything. So if you want to know everything about the uh, flow patterns, your viscosity, uh, so uh, you would, uh, we will normally go to uh, capillary rheometers. So this will tell you your viscosity as a function of temperature, your viscosity as a function of shear rate, and gives you a proper predictions of your feeding pressure. Uh, and to take, it, to take it one step further, if you want to know uh, something about the shrinkage, the volumetric shrinkage, or the wattage, then uh, you will need to know the specific volume. Uh, as a function of the uh, pressure and the temperature, so that's what the PVT uh, would uh, stem, uh, would do for you. And uh, for thermal set materials, and also uh, for uh, viscoelastic uh, uh, properties, uh, we would need to use uh, uh, these uh, rotational rheometers to uh, tell us everything about the, uh, uh, for example, reactive viscosities for GMT and uh, SMC, and also uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, linear uh, viscoelastic properties for uh, thermoplastic and, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you want to know uh, something about the physical properties, uh, properties of the polymers, such as uh, uh, your melting temperature, your glass transition temperature, and uh, so on, so uh, then you will need to uh, use a DSC to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do the uh, characterizations. And also we have a TMA in uh, in-house, so the TMA will tell you something about the anisotropic shrinkage. So what we have from a PVT is an isotropic shrinkage, but the, uh, if you have a fiber field materials, then you will need to uh, use the uh, TMA to uh, uh, separate the uh, 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 anisotropic feeding effects uh, due to a fiber, uh, uh, fiber feeding uh, uh, effect. 
And also uh, for uh, uh, mechanical properties, we have this uh, instrument. Uh, so this is a pretty cool instrument. So what's so special about this uh, instrument is that the, it's got the optical extent uh, diameters. So it's a very, uh, very uh, uh, precise. It relies on uh, uh, infrared detections. So uh, we also welcome a new, uh, a few newcomers to our uh, <coughs> characterization uh, 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 families. So uh, uh, what we have here is uh, a, another one machine is called a PVT uh, for thermal cell materials. But instead of the uh, uh, pressure and the temperature, uh, what we have added here is the specific volume as a function of curates. So this will tell you a curing shrinkage uh, as a function of temperature and as a function of time. And the next in, uh, instrument is uh, uh, dynamic mechanical analysis. So if you are from a polymer, uh, polymer bike backgrounds, then you will, need, you will know about something about these uh, instruments. So it will tell you uh, everything about its uh, mechanical properties. So that's what, what we call about solid viscous elasticities. And uh, it will tell you about, the, uh, it will help you to do the uh, warpage predictions and also annealing predictions. And also we uh, acquire a new instrument. So this is uh, uh, specifically for rubber. So this will tell you this, uh, will give you a scotch in the uh, curve. So we'll tell you the form pressure and also as well as the uh, torque. And the last uh, uh, instruments that we have, uh, we added to our uh, family is uh, the form qualification systems. So this will tell you everything about our PU forming uh, material properties. So uh, essentially, this will tell you how fast the material is uh, rising and uh, how long it takes to cure the materials. So because this year we just added uh, a new module to our, uh, uh, to our um, uh, simulation capabilities. So uh, this, is, uh, this is why we introduced a uh, format to our uh, existing uh, uh, line of uh, uh, instruments. And uh, uh, it's a pretty uh, uh, neat instrument to have. So when we are talking about uh, uh, quality simulations, uh, everything starts with the feeling. If you don't have a quality feeling uh, uh, predictions, there is no way that you would have a quality uh, quality simulations uh, from uh, you know, for example, like the uh, uh, packing predictions, uh, wipe out, and also a wipeage predictions. So everything starts uh, with the uh, um, feeling predictions. So the most important piece of uh, 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 information. Uh, uh, for feeding information is your viscosity measurements. So if you go to any rheological uh, labs, the chances are that you're going to see these two instruments uh, uh, coexisting. Uh, the first one is called a rotational rheometer, and uh, the, uh, the one on the uh, bottom right-hand corner is called capillary rheometers. So the reason that we have these two instruments is that uh, they have different um, uh, shear rate range. So the uh, rotational rheometers will give you a lower shear rate range, and the uh, capillary rheometers will give you a higher shear rate range. And uh, if you look at the capillary rheometers, so uh, this is what we have closest to a uh, real injection molding machines without actually using one to obtain a, a rheological properties of the melt. So the piston here actually simulates what uh, your screw and uh, your uh, uh, and uh, here we have a, a sample soak in the reservoir. So this, this will simulate your barrel and uh, you, uh, you have a, a very tiny capillary uh, at the end of, the, uh, uh, of your uh, 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 reservoirs. So this capillary is even smaller, uh, probably one or two millimeter in the diameter, smaller than what you have uh, for your uh, injection molding machine, uh, the uh, male entrance. And uh, <clears throat> so these capillary rheometers, uh, when we push the pistons at very high uh, speeds, this is going to generate high velocities and in terms of high, uh, high shear rate. So uh, the capillary rheometers is what we have uh, closest, uh, in, ter in terms of a shear rate, closest to uh, what we can uh, achieve in, uh, in an actual injection of molding machines. Uh, but uh, during the injection molding uh, process, uh, it's not at every instance that we have a very uh, high shear rate. So for example, uh, when we are almost uh, finished with the uh, injection the molding uh, uh, process, uh, when we are switching to the uh, packing process, then the uh, shear rate might be low. So in that case, 
uh, we will need the uh, you know uh, viscosity data at the uh, low shear rate uh, range uh, in order to do a quality uh, CA simulations. So this is what uh, the rotational reameters uh, would provide us information for. So if we look at the uh, layout for the rotational reameters, uh, so uh, the sample is uh, soaked between uh, uh, two uh, fixtures. So we have a, a fixed plate at the bottom, and the top plate is a rotating plate. Either it's a cone and a uh, cone and a plate, or it it, uh, it is another parallel plate. So uh, the, uh, basically, we would uh, rotate the top plate at a certain uh, rotational speed. And let's say if you have two uh, materials uh, uh, to be tested, and the one that gives you a, a higher torque at the, at the same rotational uh, speed, then uh, you will know that what, uh, that particular material has higher viscosity. So this is uh, some of the uh, basic uh, fundamental principles for, for using these uh, two uh, instruments. So in our uh, in lab, uh, uh, pretty much we uh, we can do uh, material characterizations for all the um, uh, plastics, uh, common common plastics from a PE PP uh, to uh, engineering plastic like nylon or pig or uh, LCPs. And uh, we would usually uh, uh, use uh, uh, shear rate from uh, 10 to uh, uh, 10,000 or even more. And uh, the uh, viscosity models, uh, we have uh, different uh, viscosity models uh, supported, but the most common uh, viscosity model is a cross WLF models. And uh, these models will take, it, take into account of the shear rate effects, the uh, temperature effects, and uh, so on and so forth. And after that, we have a very uh, uh, experienced technicians, uh, he, uh, she would take the data and uh, convert it into uh, uh, material uh, uh, parameters for the uh, models. And for the uh, low shear rate range, uh, this is uh, what I was uh, the, uh, describing earlier. Because at the low shear rate range, uh, what we have is a transition from the uh, 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 Newtonian region uh, to a uh, non-Newtonian region. So, so we need to capture that the plateau. And it is uh, important that when we are doing the uh, simulations uh, to have this uh, piece of uh, uh, data. So that's why we use these uh, uh, rotational uh, reameters. So if we look at the uh, rotational reameters, so first, it can provide data at the uh, low shear rate range. And secondly, uh, it can also tell you uh, uh, something about the viscoelastic properties of your polymer melt. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, polymer itself or your plastic melt uh, is itself is not just a viscous uh, materials. It it also has a uh, elastic components. So when we uh, use these uh, uh, rotational reameters, it will tell us something about the viscoelastic properties of the polymer itself. And just now I was uh, discussing about uh, viscosity as a function of a uh, uh, shear rate, but then uh, another factor that is equally important is uh, vis is uh, the, the temperature influence. So when we are speaking about uh, injection molding process, usually there are a few uh, pro uh, uh, important parameters. The first one, of course, is your shear rate, your injection speed. The second one is your temperature. And the third one is your pressure. Okay, so the viscosity, of, uh, the temperature, uh, of course, uh, has a very uh, if, in, important effect on the viscosity. So what you are looking at here on the left-hand side, is the part of the sensitivity of the uh, viscosity as a function of uh, temperatures. So Tb is the sensitivity of factors. So the, the steeper the slope um, means that uh, these uh, materials is more sensitive, its viscosity is more sensitive to a change in, uh, in the temperatures. So that if we are looking at the uh, PMMA or PC, uh, you know, these are materials uh, for optical applications. We all know that these materials are very sensitive to uh, change in the uh, temperatures or slight uh, uh, perturbations in their temperature. And uh, this is uh, because they have a very uh, 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 temperature sensitive uh, factors. However, if we look at uh, materials such as a PP or a LDPE, so these materials uh, are not as sensitive to uh, uh, any uh, change in the temperatures. So that's why uh, when we are processing PP or PE, uh, no one really uh, you know, care too much about any slight change in the temperatures, and this is why. 
And why are these uh, temperature uh, sensitivities uh, important uh, uh, to uh, simulations? So uh, when we are uh, discuss when we are talking about simulations, uh, we want to know okay if the floor is a balance, uh, whether you have a balance floor in your runner or in your cavities. So we, with our uh, these uh, temperature factors, uh, we cannot discuss in about the uh, importance of this uh, 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 the importance of temperatures and we discuss this. So this is an example of uh, of the uh, uh, temperature sensitivities and we discuss this. So this is a, a four imbalance um, a case. So what we have here is the uh, melt that's uh, traveling at the edge of the runners. Uh, it's uh, 14 at a higher, uh, faster speed. So and because the polymer itself, the melt itself, is not a very good conductor. So over over time, uh, you have a high shear rate, and uh, there is uh, accumulation of the temperatures, and as a result, your viscosity drops. So you have a uh, uh, melt that's fall, uh, that's falling uh, faster uh, at the edge than uh, the melt that's falling uh, faster in the centers. So of course, when we are uh, talking about um, polymer melt uh, traveling at different uh, uh, temperatures, then that would result in uh, uh, in them having a different uh, viscosity. So let's uh, look at the uh, case considering temperature imbalance and uh, without considering the temperature imbalance. So the one on the right hand uh, uh, lower right hand corner is the one uh, that we don't consider temperature imbalance. So you see that the everything is so flat. And this is because we don't have we don't consider the temperature effect on the edge. So the uh, uh, male viscosity at the edge uh, is the same as the male viscosity uh, throughout the products. So that this is why we cannot simulate uh, this uh, 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 faster falling uh, effects near the edge. But if we look at the product itself, the product uh, the male traveling at the product uh, edge is uh, actually faster. So that's why you know uh, if we don't consider this um, uh, temperature imbalance, then uh, there is no way that we can simulate this uh, accurately. Uh, and uh, and the and the one uh, the simulations that, that when we do consider the temperature imbalance actually do uh, agree quite well with the uh, temp, uh, with the actual product. So this is another lens product. This is what we call uh, year uh, year four effect. So meaning that the melt traveling at the uh, edge is faster than the male traveling in the center so uh, over uh, over time uh, then uh, you, you're going to end up with a uh, uh, void in the centers and uh, as the uh, pressure is high the temperature is high you will end up with a burn mark in the centers and another uh, very important uh, material uh, parameters that we need to consider is uh, the pvt so the uh, uh, V stands for the specific volume, and the P stands for pressure, and uh, T stands for temperatures. So basically, what we are looking at is the specific volumes under the influence of uh, pressure and the uh, temperatures. And uh, why is this uh, important? So this is a typical PVD curve during the injection uh, molding uh, process. So on the uh, y-axis uh, is the uh, relative uh, specific volumes. And the uh, on the x-axis is the temperatures, and uh, here we are seeing so many lines. Okay, so the uh, different uh, lines represent uh, different uh, uh, packing uh, pressures. So uh, when we increase the uh, temperatures, so first of all, uh, your specific volume is going to become uh, high. Uh, this means that the, your density uh, is uh, going to become low. This is uh, very easy to un understand because when we increase the temperatures, we give the systems more energy, so the systems can mo uh, move uh, freely, and in that case, the density will become lower, and the specific volume will become uh, higher. However, uh, when we apply pressure, it's a different uh, phenomena. So if we apply higher pressure, uh, this will take out the free volume in the space. So in that case, the specific volume is going to decrease, and uh, the density is going to become uh, higher. So in this case here, we are looking at the uh, two different locations for these uh, products. So the red line here is the locations uh, near the gate, and the blue line here is the locations at the end of the fittings. So you can uh, observe that for these uh, specific products, even though it's not a very huge product, but uh, different areas they do follow different uh, PVT uh, trajectories. 
So what that means is that the, at the end of the fittings, uh, you, uh, you are not going to have a uniform PVT properties throughout your products. And uh, at the end, you will have uh, the different shrinkage in the different areas. So that will result uh, in a wattage issues uh, for, your, uh, for your parts. So this is why uh, a quality uh, PVT uh, uh, is uh, very important during the uh, injection or molding the process. And this is how we utilize the, the PVT uh, uh, data. So when we have the PVT data, uh, what we can uh, tell the uh, simulation is that, okay, I want to optimize the wattage. So the, uh, uh, the software will optimize the wattage based on the PVT data uh, that you provided. So the one on the top, uh, on the top, uh, on the uh, uh, top corner uh, is the uh, PVT data without uh, optimizations, and uh, you can observe that okay, uh, without optimizations, the wattage is going to be uh, quite high, and the PVT data on the right hand uh, uh, lower right hand corner is up to after optimizations. So you see a much more smooth transitions from uh, after after the injections and after the packings. Then the uh, wattage is uh, uh, is much more uh, 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 is mo much more improved. So uh, we also have uh, material uh, uh, testing capabilities for different uh, materials. So for example, if you are in the thermal set uh, business, uh, we also have uh, uh, testing capabilities for uh, uh, thermal set materials such as uh, EMC or epoxy or underfills. So for these materials, uh, what is important is viscosity as a function of time and viscosity as a function of uh, temperature. And because these are uh, thermos materials, they do cure uh, over time. And what the, when the material cures, uh, the viscosity uh, will increase. So what we usually see here uh, is a very uh, texty transition uh, here. So the viscosity, viscosity will first drop as a, uh, when you increase the temperatures. And then as you continuously to increase the temperatures, uh, the curing effects are kick in and uh, the, uh, uh, the cross linking uh, will become uh, uh, more important. So the viscosity uh, uh, will increase uh, sharply. So this is the uh, uh, viscosity uh, uh, for thermal cell materials. And of course, we will also use a DSC to uh, help us determine is a curing kinetics. So these are the uh, testing uh, uh, capabilities that we have for thermal set materials, and also if you are working with on uh, you uh, on underfill materials, uh, the driving force uh, is no longer uh, your injection pressure, but rather your capillary pressure can do a lot of uh, 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 can do a lot of work. So in this case, we need to uh, determine the capillary uh, capillary interactions using the counter angle uh, uh, measurements. And, and the, the other one is uh, for the uh, mechanical analysis for DMC. Uh, it, it, it is usually required some uh, post mole cure uh, process. So we need to use a DMA to determine its uh, relaxation modules uh, for that the process. Okay. And I was uh, telling that uh, this year we added another uh, instrument to our uh, family. So this is the uh, PVT. Uh, with the curing uh, shrinkage uh, measurements, so what we call the PVTC, and because for the thermal cell materials, uh, volume metric shrinkage is not just a function of temperature or not just a function of pressure, but it is also a function of a conversion. So in this case, uh, we can determine the volume metric shrinkage as a function of a conversion. And imagine that if you are work, working uh, for a very uh, uh, precise uh, electronic uh, uh, components such as the uh, semiconducting uh, uh, packaging uh, uh, sectors, then you would uh, need to determine the volumetric shrinkage uh, as a function of a uh, conversion. Okay. And uh, furthermore, uh, we also have uh, testing capabilities for automotive uh, surprise. So in this, uh, in in the last few years, we've seen uh, the uh, trends moving towards a uh, lightweight, and uh, and uh, you see here they are. Uh, 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 this uh, little girl can carry a bumper using just uh, you know uh, her uh, two hands. So this is a very uh, lightweight. For, so for this two for this uh, composite materials, we also have uh, testing capabilities. And uh, here uh, for our simulations, we can uh, simulate basically uh, from uh, unreinforced fibers, uh, shell fibers, uh, all the way to a mat and a fabric. 
So that means we are uh, we also have uh, certain uh, capabilities for these uh, 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 simulation uh, uh, modules. So this is a compression of modules using the gas metal thermoplastic. So the raw materials is a sheet, uh, it's no longer a pellet. So the compression action will squeeze your melt, uh, which contains a lot of uh, uh, fibers, into these uh, ribs. So what you are looking at here is the uh, compression actions of these uh, materials uh, 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 being squeezed into the uh, these uh, ribs. And uh, <clears throat> so for these uh, compression materials, uh, we are also developing another uh, type of uh, characterization capabilities. So this is called squeeze flow. So we no longer use a uh, uh, rotational reameter. So uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are using uh, two parallel plates, and uh, we use and uh, we apply a squeeze actions to determine its uh, viscosity. So this is a very uh, unique uh, viscosity uh, characterization uh, method. And if you are working on uh, recent transfer models, uh, we also have uh, uh, capabilities to determine uh, the permeabilities of your fiber mat or, or your fiber clock. Okay. So for the uh, fiber mat and the fiber uh, uh, clock, uh, what we need to know is the uh, how the flow, how the melt fund is uh, traveling in different directions. You in your imprint directions, your uh, K11 and K22, or in your thickness directions. So this is what we uh, need to determine. And uh, for uh, material events, material characterizations, uh, and uh, we've learned a lot in the last uh, few years uh, through interactions with our customers. So we learned that the uh, pressure uh, viscosity is no longer is no longer just a function of a temperature and uh, a shear rate. What we learned is that the, uh, under high pressure, uh, the pressure also has a significant effect on the viscosity because it take out uh, the free volume in your systems. So uh, when the pressure is high, we can no longer neglect the pressure effect on the, uh, on the viscosity. So you might be wondering how high of a pressure uh, that you, uh, you need to go to in order for this, uh, uh, this pressure uh, effects to be a significant. So usually the rule of thumb is that if you are working uh, with amorphous materials uh, such as a PC, and if your injection molding uh, 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 pressure is uh, greater than 150 uh, megapascal, then this pressure effect on viscosity is, uh, is uh, significant. So now we also need to consider uh, viscosity as a function of temperature and uh, uh, pressure rate and the pressure. Uh, so in the past, we, all, we only consider uh, viscosity as a function of shear rate and the temperature. So this is uh, another reason why we need to uh, consider uh, Viscosity as a function of a temperature. Uh, uh, sorry, viscosity as a function of pressure. So what you are looking at is the pressure drop. Uh, in the case of a high pressure versus low pressure. So in the case of a high pressure, you see that the pressure is uh, just keeps on going up and up. So this means that the viscosity just keeps on going up and up. So in this case, we if we don't apply a corrections to our pressure as a uh, prediction uh, to our viscosity predictions then there is no way that we can do a simulate, uh, quality uh, simulations. And uh, the reason is because uh, when we are doing the uh, uh, simulations, uh, uh, although the injection molding machines can drive your materials in, uh, if you just keep on uh, adding uh, more pressures. But during our predictions, uh, what you see here is that, okay, the pressure uh, on the uh, top uh, left hand corner, the pressure predictions uh, uh, from our simulations is actually quite uh, quite off from the experiments uh, without taking these uh, pressure effects on the viscosities. And after we correct for the pressure effect, it is much closer. And um, this has a few uh, significant uh, impacts. So uh, first, it will help you to do a more accurate uh, dimensional predictions. And uh, the reason is because during the packing phase, uh, if the packing pressure is not correct, uh, there is no way that you can know, you can uh, estimate how much materials is being squeezed in uh, during the packing phase. And in, in this case, your PVT is not correct and uh, the warpage petition is not, not, uh, not correct. <clears throat> and uh, so in turn, uh, so uh, overall, uh, after we take into account of the pressure uh, effect on the, uh, <clears throat> on the viscosities, 
uh, we can uh, do a much more uh, uh, accurate predictions on the pressure predictions and in terms the warpage predictions after we take into account of the pressure effects is also uh, much better and uh, another factor that would affect your dimensional accuracy is uh, crystallinity so in the past uh, uh, this effect is uh, usually been neglected but now as uh, our understanding of the materials uh, becomes uh, more more and more uh, well understood then we understood that this uh, uh, effect is uh, pretty important so we uh, we use this uh, D we use DSC to help us to determine the um, uh, uh, crystallization of kinetics so basically we would do it at different uh, cooling rates to determine is a uh, crystallization kinetics and uh, the maximum cooling rates that we can achieve using uh, uh, using our current uh, instruments uh, uh, is uh, about 600 degrees per minute so this is uh, sufficient for most uh, injection of molding uh, process okay. and the reason why this is important is that uh, when we don't take into account the uh, crystal uh, crystallization effect uh, our predictions is very far from the experiments so you see the uh, experiments is uh, very uh, the shrinkage is much more uh, severe than the uh, uh, than the predictions without taking into account of the uh, pressure effect and also very far from the uh, cat dimensions but after we take into account of the pressure effect uh, the prediction is uh, much better and is much more closer to the uh, experimental results okay and another factor that is uh, quite important uh, uh, and also is the highlight of our uh, material characterization uh, this year is the uh, viscoelasticity and the important is, and the reason is because uh, polymer itself is not just a uh, uh, viscous uh, materials it also has uh, uh, the elastic properties so we would rely on uh, this uh, viscoelastic uh, uh, behaviors to help us determine the material properties so usually we would look at the G prime and the G double prime. So G prime and the G double prime stands for uh, <coughs> uh, elastic and uh, loss modules for the uh, materials. And uh, during the injection of molding process, uh, when the powder melts is been uh, subject uh, to a high shear rate, uh, they are usually they have been uh, stretched. But uh, as we know that the injection molding process is a very uh, swift process so usually your polymers wants to relax back to its original state but it cannot because it's been trapped into this uh, uh, semi-relaxation uh, uh, stage uh, this, this is what, what, uh, what we usually call uh, the trap in the limbo uh, stage and in this case the, uh, the polymer is uh, the melt itself is not uh, very happy so they, uh, they have a lot of uh, residual stress and the residual stress will create a lot of issues so for example uh, the biofringes uh, is one of them and when we have a biofringes uh, this we, uh, we usually affect the optical properties so uh, this is the uh, effect of uh, flow induced uh, uh, residual stress so we see that okay uh, the flow induced residual stress uh, does create a lot of uh, issues and especially near the gates and this is because the, near the gates uh, when the shear rate is the highest uh, your chain are being uh, stretched uh, to the most extent so uh, in in those regions uh, the uh, uh, the residual stress is the uh, most uh, uh, severe <clears throat> and uh, here uh, we also introduce another uh, functionalities to our software and this is uh, their modules as a function of our time so uh, if you are familiar with the polymer physics uh, this is called relaxation modules so uh, basically what we are looking at is the uh, modules as a function of time and also as a function of uh, the, the different environments such as the temperatures and this is important for predictions uh, such as uh, uh, annealing uh, for applications uh, such as uh, as annealing or even for long-term uh, uh, applications such as uh, uh, under the hood uh, uh, usage so for the uh, for under the under the hood the usage even though the temperature is not very high but you are sub you are subjecting your materials uh, to a temperature environment for a long time so in this case uh, you want to know it's a relaxation uh, uh, behaviors uh, because you want to predict it's a long-term uh, material properties so this is why uh, uh, solid viscoelastic uh, applications is very important and this is the warpage uh, predictions uh, you know 
uh, before and after the uh, annealing process. And what we see after the annealing uh, process is that the uh, warpage, uh, the uh, warpage uh, does uh, go, go down significantly. And this is because we give the systems uh, uh, sufficient energies to, uh, uh, to relax its uh, molecular stress. So the warpage uh, will go down in this case. And also the residual stress uh, uh, does go down uh, after the uh, uh, after the annealing process, uh, and the uh, uh, effect is quite significant. It uh, it has gone down from a five hundred megapascal all the way down to a sixty megapascal. And uh, uh, <clears throat> if you are working uh, on a rubber, uh, we also have a rubber rheometers. Uh, for these uh, for the rubber application, so the rubber rheometers will tell you everything you know about you need to know about the pressure curve and uh, also uh, everything you need to know about the uh, torque curve. Because when uh, when customers approach us uh, about the uh, rubber characterizations, they uh, they 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 will usually use these uh, rubber rheometers. So you uh, that means that we have to be able to speak the same language as them as they do. So this is why uh, we obtain the rubber rheometers and uh, we help uh, our rubber uh, uh, customers to do uh, characterizations uh, using these uh, rubber uh, rheometers. So for the uh, rubber rheometers, what you're looking at is the pressure curve and the torque curve. And usually the pressure curve uh, would uh, go up first, uh, then the uh, torque curve. So uh, when you are doing the uh, rubber manufacturers, uh, usually you want to uh, adjust your recipes according to these uh, two, uh, two curves. Uh, you want to maximize uh, your pressure curve and also you want to maximize your torque curve. Uh, meaning that you don't want the, uh, the torque to uh, go up too fast before your pressure goes up. Uh, if that uh, does happen, then your materials become too hardened uh, for the uh, 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 for the for the uh, foam uh, forming to uh, happen, and uh, we can also do the uh, uh, fittings using the uh, data obtained by the uh, uh, foam rheometers, and uh, we can fit it uh, using our current uh, existing uh, uh, models. And uh, finally, uh, uh, this is the uh, current uh, setup in our material research centers. Uh, just this year, uh, our material research center has under uh, significant uh, uh, renovations and uh, also under uh, have undergone a significant upgrades. And uh, we we've added a few uh, uh, few instruments to our existing uh, material testing capabilities. And uh, we are hoping that by doing so, we can help our customers to do a uh, better material characterizations and in terms of uh, more. Uh, quality uh, CAE simulations. And if you have any uh, issues, I'll be uh, happy to uh, help you. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer you.